Welcome everyone to Imtirtsu's Zionist Salon. I'm Doug Altebeth, chairman of the board of Imtirtsu, and it is a pleasure to welcome a great champion, I would even say a latter-day hero of the Jewish people, Ambassador David Friedman. David, welcome to the Zionist Salon. Thank you, Doug. It's good to be with you. David Friedman revolutionized his position as ambassador here. He served not just as uh, the United States' representative to us here, not just as a conveyor of Israel's policies and sensibilities back to Washington, but he was a true consensual advisor, helping to mold and shape policies that were designed to benefit both countries, that were based on his searing intelligence, tremendous creativity, and perhaps above all, his great love for both countries and his desire to build on the already strong relationship between them. David, I want to tell you that uh, your book, Sledgehammer, was an absolute page turner, even on Kindle. And it was something that I thoroughly enjoyed. And this is a a perhaps shameless, but a totally sincere plug. Anyone who hasn't read it, really to understand what happened during the Trump years in Israel needs to pick up Sledgehammer. And it's a great, great read. It really read to me like like a, uh, a TV drama series, one challenge after another, one adventure after another. And through it all, what comes through is your creativity, your resourcefulness, Yes, your ability to be a sledgehammer when needed, but also to be smooth as silk when that was called upon. So it really was quite something. And, Thank you, Doug. Thank you so much. And, and now your ambassadorship is fueling the next stage, as I see it, of your career, which is to be a Jewish statesman, a creative Jewish seer, helping to make good things happen, preventing bad things from happening, and hopefully helping to birth some important new initiatives. So let's start with your ascension to your role. Here you are, and you laid it out in a very compelling, and I thought it was quite humorous way. You are, you were, a very valued legal business advisor to Donald Trump, the real estate developer. And as Donald Trump became Donald Trump, the politico, did it occur to you that your relationship might change with him as well? I certainly hoped it would. Um, I, you know, I saw in Donald Trump uh, two things. Number one, somebody who uh, very well could ascend to the most powerful position in the world. And, and second of all, I saw someone who, in that position, uh, would potentially be very much uh, an ally of Israel, a supporter of the values that I uh, that I hold dear. And uh, just because, you know, we had a history together and I, I felt that he had confidence in me, I thought that potentially um, it might create a role for me mm -hmm. to do something, you know, very valuable that, that would give great meaning to my life and hopefully help the Jewish people. Right. So uh, I, I certainly began to think about it, even from the moment he went down that, that famous mm -hmm. escalator ride at Trump Tower. Were you surprised that he was looking to smart business advisors, but political neophytes such as yourself and Jason Greenblatt to be his Middle East brain trust and kitchen cabinet, as it were? Well, remember, he's a neophyte, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, he, he hasn't got uh, 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 much of a background in politics, domestic or, uh, or, or global. Um, you know, he was basically relying on his wits, and he was prepared to, you know, uh, associate with others who came with the same uh, the same set of qualities, um, you know, obviously for things like um, the military, um, you need you need experts. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to diplomacy, I think he he, he viewed um, the skills necessary is not necessarily being experienced. And in, in, in a sense, he felt that um, given U.S. track record in the Middle East, um, uh, you know, if you were experienced in that area, you were also um, quite adept at failure. Right. So I, I don't think that's what he was looking for. And I right. think, again, he saw, I think he saw in me somebody who, um, who had good sense, who had, um, you know, the, the, who's, who was willing to, you know, have the courage of his convictions and, and make a difference. And remember, we were 
coming into office on the heels of really the nadir, I would say, in U.S.-Israel relationship, mm -hmm. when uh, when the U.S. allowed U.N. Security Council Resolution yeah. 2334 to pass, which essentially, you know, held even uh, even the Western Wall to be illegally occupied territory. So we were coming in, you know, uh, really from the depths, and he wanted somebody who could insert himself quickly and and and, and change the trajectory. Right. So I, I it, it it was you know, looking back on it, it, it was to me it was a miracle the whole thing. I mean, to, to go from uh, being a practicing lawyer to have this position is, is entirely miraculous. But right. looking back on it, in terms of the skill sets that he was looking for, it's not uh, it's not that remarkable that he would would want to work with someone like me. Well, apropos of that, you know, there's an there's an old Hollywood expression that it takes a lifetime to become an overnight sensation, <laughs> and. Um, and I think that that phrase actually applies to you because as you set forth in your book, everything in your life was like a tutorial, was like a prep course for what you became as ambassador. It was all a building process. And, and um, so now you've been asked to play, uh, as you said you hoped you would be, you've been asked to play a very, very important role. Who did you go to for practical help to help you get acclimated to help you get up to speed with the nitty-gritty of what you would have to do well so i had some very kind um uh overtures uh from from some you know really serious people so i, I met with um with henry kissinger i met with uh, tony blair uh they were both very generous with their time with mm -hmm. me um i think i met um uh, i recall meeting uh, with um, uh, with Dennis Ross and and, and, and some of uh, some of the people who go back you know 20 30 years in this mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. um, you know and I met with uh, a lot of people in the State Department and and I'll tell you look as, as I point out in my book um, the, the people that were sort of the careerists in the State Department um, not providing <laughs> I mean, they provided me a huge amount of of, of helpful guidance, mm. but the guidance was not, uh, you know, uh, it was not that I would uh, take their advice. The guidance was, you know, I'm going to be up against uh, a huge headwind in terms of advancing mm. uh, the president's policies, my own views, and I, I needed to, you know, basically steal myself in order to, you know, get ready. You know, it's sort of like, you know. I'm going to have to fasten my seatbelt. There's going to be some turbulence, you know, right. over the next couple of years. But I got to just get ready to ride it through. And um, and, and I'm glad. I mean, th th those 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 are perhaps the most valuable uh, meetings I had were the ones with the people who didn't agree with me. Right. Many ambassadors are not necessarily career diplomats, but this is not just any ambassadorial position. So. Was there resentment? I, I, I find it hard to believe you were greeted with open arms by what Truman used to call the striped pants set. Um, but uh, well, was yeah, that I mean, I was greeted. Case? I was greeted to some extent with fear mm. uh, by some because I had this uh, very close relationship with the president, and uh, at the end of the day, the foreign policy of the United States is set by the president, who has enormous power and influence so there were limits to how far people would push back but there were there were effort i mean i was not greeted warmly at all um uh, as i point out in my book there were people that i think viewed me as sort of a passing curiosity that mm. you know would kind of self-destruct in, in short order um but um again you know uh, I've, I've said this many times but you know uh all of this there's there's two factors here that you know really are are overriding um, the first is, you know, I believe in God, and I believe that God uh, certainly protected me on this path. And the second thing is, um, the president trusted me and was willing to give me a, a very wide berth, uh, a huge runway, to not just execute, but actually to set U.S. Israel policy. And th those things are um, uh, in, in that order of priority. Those two things, above all else, were. Um, with the, the most important factors in, in getting from the beginning to the end. Well, that, you know, I mean, you touched on something very important, which is on the one hand, you say very, very aptly that it is the president who creates foreign policy. On the other hand, or, or at the same time, this is a man who trusted you implicitly. 
and, and knew that you had, I mean, I have to believe that it is not a coincidence that he turned to you and Jason and Jared, three Orthodox Jews, three believers who uh, were steeped in uh, their Judaism, steeped in an awareness of this region, uh, that this could provide tremendous perspective to him uh, and tremendous uh, understanding, get him up to speed very quickly and in a way that would be designed to move the ball forward. Um, so it is an amazing thing that you had that kind of trust uh, and, and of course, you, uh, you made very good on it. I mean, you, you uh, absolutely uh, validated his decision in that regard. I, I'll just tell you, I keep now on my computer the uh, John Kerry's four no's uh, speech, just, you know, where he says, no, 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 no peace, no peace without making peace with the Palestinians, just as a way of referencing how far we've come. Uh, you know, thanks to you, thanks to the president and, and his team. I mean, it, it's like a light year change. And, and in that regard, when you look at your tenure, it's breathtaking the amount of achievements that one can point to. There was the, the recognition of, by the United States that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. There's moving the embassy to Jerusalem. There's the recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan, the refutation that somehow uh, settlements in Judea and Samaria are illegal. Uh, and then, of course, the crowning uh, uh, achievement were the Abraham Accords. So, I mean, you know, any one of these would, would be, uh, you know, a victory lap and the stuff of a lifetime for, for someone who was serving in your position, and you have all of them to point to. Plus, in the background, looming over it all, was a very detailed peace and prosperity plan that was designed to uh, further the interests of both parties in the region, that was designed to help... Uh, the Palestinians understand that the U United States had a profound interest in the economic, economic development of the Palestinians. And um, probably that plan, uh, and we'll talk more about it, but I would think that that, in effect, helped increase the viability of the Abraham Accords, the fact that that plan was put on the table, that there was concern for for making sure that there would be a could be a viable future for the Palestinians, and sure. um, you know that plan, the peace and prosperity plan, which some touted as the deal of the century, it didn't go very far because of the out of hand rejection by the Palestinians. But am I right to wonder that the very fact that it was presented in great detail with great sincerity? Uh, in effect, played a, an important role in uh, enabling the, the Abraham Accords to, to uh, be birthed. I remember reading in your book something to the effect that um, Bibi was, in effect, asked to drop any, any kind of determination to apply sovereignty uh, over uh, Area C in the uh, in Judea and Samaria, and over the Jordan Valley, as really a prerequisite, like a quid pro quo for the for the Abraham Accords. Is is that a fair way of looking at it? Am I putting the pieces together right? Or I think there are a couple more pieces as well, but those pieces are certainly part of it. Look, the the uh, the peace to prosperity plan, or I think we call it the President's Vision for Peace was a vision that uh, garnered a lot of support in the Persian Gulf. Um, uh, at that ceremony in uh, January of 2020, you had in attendance the, um, the uh, UAE, Bahraini, and Omani uh, ambassadors to the United States. They all received standing ovations at the ceremony. Uh, the Saudis uh, reacted to the plan with, with great encouragement. Uh, even though you know the Saudis had authored the Arab Peace Initiative, which they had, you know, they had touted as the definitive document, even though it's only about a page long, but they they were very complimentary and supportive of uh, of the plan. And then um, when the Palestinians kind of ripped it up, it, it did give cover, and it did cause these countries to think, well, you know, how, to what extent are we going to 
you know, put our entire futures on hold, you know, uh, in order to placate, you know, a very, very unreasonable position. So that's 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 part of it. The part you talked about about sovereignty, um, yeah. The, the there was a request by the uh, Emiratis that sovereignty be be um, uh, delayed. But I, I think it's very important, you know, certainly from my perspective, because we negotiated language at length. I was insistent that the um, that that this would be that the, the the language would be temporal. That it would be it would be delayed for you know a few years but uh, not um not canceled or not um not in any way taken off the table mm -hmm. and i think that you know uh, while i was i'm sure the most aggressive within the government of the united states along with secretary pompeo in supporting um, the sovereignty movement uh, i do feel good about the fact that that we have put it on the table and it's on the table and everyone, I think, who we dealt with understands that it's not going away. It was simply designed to to, to be um, temporarily suspended while the um, Abraham Accords kind of grew and flourished. Mm -hmm. But there's another point, too, which um, I think probably gets less attention, which is, you know, I believe the Abraham Accords, um, I think the most important step forward for the Abraham Accords was when we moved our embassy to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and and the events that followed, whether it was the Golan Heights or whether it was the what we refer to as the Pompeo Doctrine with regard to the legality of settlements in Judea and Samaria, what we showed the world was that America was going to stand with Israel, mm. you know, unconditionally, unapologetically. This is our ally. There's nothing you can do to break that bond. And in fact, that bond's only going to get stronger and stronger. And we don't care what the rest of the world says. Mm -hmm. You could pass, you know, UN resolutions condemning it. Doesn't matter. We're going to veto it at the Security Council, and the General Assembly can do whatever it wants. America is going to stand with Israel. And as that message uh, strengthened and strengthened over time, I think the Gulf nations looked at Israel uh, in a different way. They looked at Israel. You know, Israel's permanent. Israel's not going anywhere. Israel is a great ally of the United States. All these countries want to be allied with the United States as well. So I think Israel became a far more attractive partner for normalization with all these countries, which all have their own interests. You know, they mm -hmm. they have many important interests separate and apart from the Palestinians. And they began to think, you know, it's in our national interest to normalize with Israel. Um, and if the Palestinians are going to, you know, just be rejectionist, so be it. We're going to move forward. So I think all of these steps, uh, people think that, um, you know, we made, we got to the Abraham Accords in spite of our our work on Jerusalem and the Golan Heights and the settlements. I, I think just the opposite. I think the Abraham Accords right. came around because of our right. uh, strengthening Israel and all these matters and our clear message to the world that America is going to stand with Israel. Right. Well, that that's a really it's a fascinating observation. And I think it's a profound insight into how this neighborhood works, because this is yes. a neighborhood that really takes its cues from actions and not from statements. And and actions meaning power and the application of power, uh, the the uh, the alliance, the the active alliance, the active affinity of the United States with Israel. Just what you said, and and you know one can say that Dafka, you know the very fact that. All of those things happened, and the United States put forward a plan to help the Palestinians at the same time, which was not a zero-sum game, and it wasn't intended to uh, denigrate from American support for Israel, because that's sometimes this, the feeling here that we get, that yeah. you know we're being asked to, uh, to sacrifice, we're being asked to uh, step back in the name of you know, something larger. But maybe the, the, the combination of those two helped create a, a tremendous sense uh, among the Emiratis and others that, that the U.S. was very sin, uh, sincere about Israel, very serious about Israel. And, uh, you know, to do this, you know, you just sort of look at test the winds and, you know, the winds are saying it's time, it's okay to really uh, to come to the table and do something with Israel. Um, sure. Apropos of that, David, you know, here we are now. Uh, things are changing in the world. You have in the East now a, a, a looming possible axis between China, Russia, Iran, 
And at the same time, arguably, there is a sense that the U.S. might be pulling back from the region. Does all of this, to your way of thinking, provide an opportunity for the for the Abraham Accords to grow, to morph into not just a U.S. and uh, a, a, rather an Israel and Emirati uh, relationship, but but a regional one that would include non-Middle Eastern, non-Arab countries like India, like Azerbaijan, maybe even Southeast Asia. Is that is that something that you envision as a possibility? Well, we think the Abraham Accords are really boundless in terms of the opportunities, and uh, and it's, it's frustrating to be on the sidelines now because um, uh, the only way they really advance is with a strong America. Um, you know, it, it, as you look at the Abraham Accords, um, you have to understand each one of these is, is a separate agreement under a common umbrella. In every one of these agreements, I think the way to look at it is to look, you know, envision a triangle mm. where Israel and a Muslim country are at the base of the triangle, and at the apex, you have the United States. Mm -hmm. And the role of the United States is different but critical in all these mm -hmm. cases. It was it was very different in Sudan than it was with the UAE. It was very different with Morocco than it was with the UAE. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the, these are these are all circumstances where America uh, exercises its power, its influence, its encouragement, uh, and and it makes both countries feel like. Like it has their back, and that it will support the, um, you know, it will support these new relationships even as they begin to, you know, grow and flourish, and occasionally hit uh, hit some turbulence. Um, America is not in a position to do that right now, and 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 I and that's why it's frustrating. I mean, we're not uh, we're not projecting our power. We're just not, uh, and we've because we fail to project our power. What the administration right now is doing is they're just kind of putting their finger in the dikes, uh, wherever there's a uh, hot spot, wherever there's a leak, mm -hmm. probably mixing metaphors here. But, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's Russia, whether it's uh, Iran, whether it's um, Afghanistan, we've, we've kind of, you know, botched our um, our foreign policy to such a great extent that all we can do right now is put out fires rather than actually um, strategically, you know, make the world a better and safer place. And so that has to change. And, and look, I think that you know uh, the, the the big the big fish the 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 big um, get that we all want is for Israel to normalize with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I firmly believe we'd have done that by now had we been in office. Right. Uh, the Saudis are um, the most important Muslim nation. They're they're the they're the keepers of the faith in you know Mecca and Medina and very wealthy and powerful country. And um, uh, you know, as they normalize with Israel, I think it just Tips the tips the scale to the point, you know, where, you know, I think every the, all the other dominoes fall into place, and you really have the end, if you will, of the Arab-Israeli conflict writ large. I mean, you'll have, mm -hmm. you know, you'll still have Lebanon and Syria and Iran to deal with, but, you know, it, it'll it'll make a huge huge difference, and and as you point out, potentially open up corridors with uh, India, with Pakistan, with Indonesia, you know, I mean, the, the sky's the limit, but. We have to get America back to a position of projecting power and influence, and leading rather than reacting to uh, to the world's challenges. And uh, um, you know, clearly, you know, America, you know, Israel's not going to normalize with Saudi Arabia in the next couple of years, given given the relationship that America has with the Saudis. Right. So let's let's play that through. In the absence of assertive American leadership, what is the best? course for Israel. What can we really hope for here? Is it just sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, intensifying a, a friendship, say, with India, trying to build a, a friendship with Indonesia, which I understand is there's a lot of sub rosa uh, contact going on. Uh, but, you know, your, your point about a, a, a triangle, uh, you, you just basically have a straight line <laughs> at this point with the Americans out. So mm -hmm. what what really is left for Israel to do, absent American assertiveness and leadership? Well, there's a lot for Israel to do, and I should say there was a lot that Israel did uh, before the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't give credit to uh, to Prime Minister Netanyahu and his team. You know, for all the work they, they did, a lot of the groundwork. You know, before the Abraham Accords, they had relations, as he's pointed, you know, below the radar. But they had relations already with with a number of these countries, and what we were able to do is to enable 
the uh, relationships to surface. And as they surface, the opportunities, you know, are just immense that that wouldn't exist, you know, just between governments, you know, whether it's healthcare or business or technology or tourism, um, all those things were necessary, can only be achieved, you know, in a public relationship rather than a private one. So Israel, of course, has, you know, relationships with some of these countries already. It, it, uh, um, uh, it, it'll continue to develop that, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, is very good about, you know, uh, working these relationships. It's got good relationships in Africa. Um, Eastern Europe is is, uh, is is moving closer to Israel politically. It's got a very important relationship, you know, with commercially with Germany and the UK. I mean, Israel is a, you know, is a first world country, you know, with a, uh, a very sophisticated approach to foreign policy. I mean, it's not sitting on its hands waiting for America to act, but there's no substitute for American leadership. I mean, it's true with Israel, it's true anywhere else in the world. Um, the world's just a much better, safer, more prosperous place when America leads. And America has to lead by projecting all of its power, whether it's military, economic, or or moral. It has to project that leadership uh, to fully actualize the opportunities. Just to finish with the peace, the prosperity plan, do you think there are any residual benefits that uh, still might come from the presentation of that plan that we don't necessarily fully appreciate today? Sure. I mean, I think, I mean, as, as one of the authors of it, I'm, I, I think it's very important. Now, I mean, I would tell you if I were writing it today, I would write it differently mm. um, because, you know, this was a collaboration of several people and, you know, we had different points of view and we we, we, we arrived at, at, at a consensus on different things. I'm, I'm not going to go into, you know, the issues that I might write differently, but, but here's the bottom line. I think the message from the plan is is really um, is 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 really critical, and 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 this is the message that I think um, I, I hope continues to um, to be heard and understood because I don't think people really get this at all outside of um, uh, outside of the real people who work on this for a living. There's two realities that that exist with regard to Israel and the Palestinians that, to my knowledge, don't really exist anywhere else. The first, in my view. Um, there, there cannot be a Palestinian state. There just can't be. Um, why? Because it would be an existential threat to the state of Israel because Israel would have no margin for error with regard to um, whether the Palestinians would engage in malign activity because the Palestinians, even even if they're, even if you take the argument, which I don't agree with, but if you make the argument that the Palestinian Authority is, is capable of running a state, they could easily be taken over by Hamas or by ISIS or Al-Qaeda or, or Hezbollah or anybody else. So the risks to Israel of a Palestinian state in any way that we traditionally define a state. Right. Um, and in and, and the plan that we wrote um, was a very atypical, non-traditional form of a state. I mean, it was a mm -hmm. state really in name only. The Palestinians didn't, cro didn't control their borders, mm -hmm. their security, their electromagnetic spectrum, their airspace. So. You know, the, the, the message that there just can't be. We tried, we looked at it, we spoke to experts across the board. There cannot be a Palestinian state in a traditional sense. And by the way, you know, that was the view of Yitzhak Rabin, who gave his life for the cause of Palestinian peace, Correct. who's the poster child for the peace movement. Even Yitzhak Rabin agreed that there could not be a Palestinian state in a traditional sense. Right. So and that's it's, why and it's the view this. of the overwhelming percentage of people here. The intuitive yes. awareness, the intuitive understanding that that would be a disaster. For completely correct and legitimate reasons. Right. The second reality is that Israel cannot absorb two and a half million Palestinians right. in Judea and Samaria as citizens of Israel. Right. It can't for reasons we don't have time to discuss, but it's right. self-evident. Self so that's it. So, you know, the, you know, the expression, you know, you can't live them, you can't, you can't, you can't live with them, you can't live without right. them. Yeah. It's sort of, we have, we have a unique um, we have a needle that we have to thread here in a very delicate, careful way. And it's not like any other place in the world. And we have to stop using, you know, kind of traditional U.S. American constitutional principles for, you know, for, for this type of a situation. Uh, which, by the way, even America, you know, doesn't observe itself. You know, America would take the view that you can't have people under your control who don't vote in national elections, except we have Puerto Rico, Guam, 
in American right. Samoa, yes, you know, and, right. and a bunch Absolutely. of other places. So even we don't, you know, we, even we observe that rule in the breach. Yes. Um, this is a unique situation. Um, it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to, you know, get the stamp of approval of of, of the uh, of, of the academic world or the hypothetical or the people who who strive for perfection. The, the resolution here has to, in the first instance, uh, it requires the abandonment of perfection. <laughs> You can't you can't look for perfect because you're never going to get it. And you have to say, how can we do the most good for the most people, create the most prosperity, the most opportunity, the most human dignity yeah. in a way that doesn't jeopardize Israel's mm -hmm. security, uh, either um, physical security or demographic security. Right. And I think our plan, you know, seeks to address those realities. And and our plan also um, conditions any level of Palestinian autonomy, even if it's only civilian autonomy on um, on reforms that, you know, I think are essential for Israel to, to provide the Palestinians, even with additional civilian autonomy. Are they going to have a transparent economic uh, system, a justice system, freedom of religion, freedom of travel? You know, uh, are you going to take your life in your hands if you go into Janine or go into Ramallah or are you going to get lynched? Yeah. You know, if, the, if those are the circumstances, then, you know, I tell my, my left wing friends in America, why would you want to have your fingerprints on any Palestinian entity that that's so repressive. I mean, you know, yeah. where homosexuality is, is a capital crime. Yeah. Is that the state you want to build? Because that's what you get. It's the willing suspension of disbelief. You know, it's like, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, to your point, look, uh, Western Europeans, I'm sure, completely disagree with the perception that there cannot be a Palestinian state. Uh, and uh, I don't know to what extent there was uh, criticism of the plan for not going far enough uh, by the EU, but I'm sure that uh, it wasn't uh, greeted with great hasanas there. No, no, the EU, well, the EU actually tried to uh, condemn the plan, uh, but they require unanimity uh, in order to do that. And they couldn't get um, Hungary, Hungary yeah. Czech Republic, a couple of other Eastern European countries refused to condemn it. Look, you know, people that, uh, I mean, most people who have their feet on the ground understand the challenges here and the difficulty. There's a reason why it hasn't been solved in, you know, in, in 75 years. Yep. And, and and I guess, I mean, more, more to the point, um, uh, you know, this is not, you know, it's, it's easy to, you know, uh, experiment on somebody else's Territory, you know, where right. if you're wrong, <laughs> right. you know, yeah, you, 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 you're wrong. You know, I made yeah. a mistake. I mean, Israel, Israel, right. Israel has literally no margin no for margin. error. I remember when we, when when Donald Trump came to Israel uh, in uh, 2017, and 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 he was uh, he was definitely not as fluent in, with the subject as he is now. And uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you know, showed him that you know the distance between, yeah. you know, uh, that you know if if the Palestinians had a state. In uh, Judea and Samaria, the, the Israel's waste would be nine miles. Would be roughly the distance between Trump Tower and the George Washington Bridge. Right. And you know, I think you know, just just to make the point that this is not, you know, this is not, you know, we're not playing a game of risk here. We're yeah. playing with people's lives, and there's no margin for error. And um, you know, Israel couldn't defend the borders that are being asked of it to. To receive to, nor yeah. should it. By the way, I mean, apart from the security, and I and I and I, I don't want to, I don't want to belittle this point because it's important, and I don't, I don't think we, I don't think it gets enough attention in America or in Israel. Um, it's not just security. I mean, it's not just security. It's also, you know, who are we? Who are the Jewish people? What are we? I mean, we gave, yeah. we gave uh, Joseph's tomb away you know, uh, to the Palestinians, it's almost impossible to get that. You risk your life in your hands going to Joseph's tomb. Yes. Can't do that with Marat Machpelo. You can't do that with um, with uh, Beit El. You can't do that with Shiloh. These are, this right. is, you know, this is the DNA of the Jewish people. Correct. And, and, I, and I'll tell you something, Doug, you know, I've, I've met with, I, I've come to know the Muslim world, you know, much more than, you know, five years ago. And, you know, they're deeply religious people. They understand what the Old Testament says, in what it in what it provides they understand the geography and frankly they, they scratch their heads and wonder why would the jewish people ever give away such you know critical land the yes. the, the, the birth the, the burial right. place of abraham right you know the place where uh 
where Hannah taught the world how to pray, right. the place where Jacob had his dream with right. the angels, we're going to give that right. away. Right. Well, I we mean, don't have to give it away. We're never. Gonna, it's going to yeah. go the way of Joseph's tomb. We'll never see it again. Right. And there, and there's, and there's, and and I don't know why we don't collectively care more about that. Right. Uh, there's there's 50, 60 million Christians that care a lot about right. it in America. <laughs> and there's right. Christians around the world right. who care about it. We should care about it too. You're, right. It's for another conversation, but you've just made the point about why Har Habayit is such a critical uh, issue for sure. us because the Muslims understand it better than the Jews. The Muslims understand that if we're willing to give away our holiest site, then it's like pulling the loose thread of a cheap polyester suit and eventually the whole thing will unravel. But uh, it's, uh, so it's, it, you know, this idea of awareness and you're absolutely right. It's not just security. It's really, it's a, it's a much deeper existential understanding that's, that's involved. I want to get back to you as we close. First of all, I'm very proud of you that you have maintained an active involvement with us post your position. Um, I had the pleasure to hear you moderate an amazing evening uh, with uh, Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro at a Tikva-sponsored conference in uh, Jerusalem a couple of weeks ago. And, um, you know, I, I think you're here, I, I think you're as visible here almost as our current ambassador, so that's all to your credit. Uh, let's talk for a minute about our new government. Uh, we... Do you see us being able to thread the needle, so to speak? In other words, this government is unlike the one that preceded it. It's in all likely going to be a right-wing government that is based on response to a lot of issues that voters want addressed. And simultaneously, uh, we're hearing from a, a lot of uh, hand-wringing, we're seeing a lot of hand-wringing and pearl-grabbing by people in America about, you know, people who might be involved in the government, are we going to be able to thread the needle and have uh, those issues addressed while still maintaining good relationships with the United States? Well, I think so. I, I, I think we can um, um, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, um, you know, the, the people spoke. The, the, the results of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the election after, you know, for full starts, I mean, they, they finally formed a government with a clear, you know, right wing majority. I think that's the will of the Israeli people. And I think people in America have deep respect for democracy and, and will respect that. That's number one. Number two, you know, the at, at, at the helm is the most experienced, you know, prime minister in Israel's history and one of the most, you know, well regarded, respected world leaders uh you know anywhere and so i think he will um to the extent that there are any flare-ups he will be able i think to manage them mm -hmm. but also look i think that you know this is um you know i don't think i, I always say you know it, in the old days when we had um you know if you asked me to tell you the difference between bill clinton and george w bush from a policy perspective you know, it, it would be hard. I have to scratch my head and really think about it. But if you, had, but you know, then we got Barack Obama, and the pendulum swung all the way to one side. If you didn't have Barack Obama, you never would have had Donald Trump, right? So now, now you have Donald Trump in response to Barack Obama. If you hadn't had this um, kind of makeshift government that was formed with the the single governing principle of not being Netanyahu and, and no other governing principles, if you hadn't had that, I don't think you, you necessarily would have had this. This government either it might have been you know but that's where we are in the world the world is the pendulum swings back and forth and and i think you know lots of countries are, are in the same place including america but i i think you know you know on the on the particular aspects of people like you know batal smotrich and itamar ben gvir and whether or not they're they're going to um create problems i don't think so i mean i know them both mm -hmm. and um uh you know I, I can just tell you that there's a huge difference between um, being out of government and being sort of, uh, a, you know, a, a pundit or a gadfly or, or trying to get your right. voice heard. And, and then and then being in a position to govern. Correct. As because Ariel you, Sharon you, famously said, what I see from here, you don't see from there. Yes. And, 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 and it's true. Um, 
It's true, and I think in any country, it, it was true, frankly, for me personally, when I, when I wasn't um, in government, you know, I, nobody was paying attention to me. I could say whatever I wanted, and sometimes there's a temptation to say things a little bit more uh, pointedly, so you get attention. Yeah. When you're in government, you, uh, you you really don't have the luxury of being wrong. That's you right. know, there's people's lives at stake. Right, and I and, think, I, do, yeah. and I think these people will be responsible. Absolutely, and I think that's that's the whole point. These are people who care deeply about the country. They don't want to put the country at risk in the name of personal advancement. They don't strike me that that's how they're no. wired at all. So let's end on a uh, on a nice positive note. Um, what do you see the opportunities for Israel over the next few years, both strategically and as a light, as an exemplar to other nations? Well, look, I, I, I you know, the, I left one thing on the table, you know, when I was in, uh, when I left office, which was dealing with uh, Judea and Samaria. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's it's potentially, you know, a third rail of of uh israeli diplomacy but it's not getting any better you know and it's not going to get any easier and um i think israel needs to you know begin to really develop a national consensus uh with regard to its um its eastern border you know uh, i tell people all the time that you know there's 190 more or less countries in the world Today, you know, more than half of those countries are younger than Israel. Mm. Israel is no longer, you know, a young country. It it it, it needs to stop thinking of itself as um, as as kind of a small country surrounded by enemies and threats. I mean, right now the whole world we all have threats. I mean, there's, you know, in modern warfare, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you're not safe just because you know you're surrounded by the Atlantic and the right. Pacific, correct? And Mexico and Canada. I mean, everybody's got risks, and Israel's some respects with God's help, you know, uh, well equipped to handle those risks. It's mm -hmm. got to start thinking about, uh, you know, what it wants to be when it grows up. Yeah. And I think it's time. And I think that, you know, uh, you know, without, without, I mean, people obviously know how I think about it, but regardless of how I think about it, I think, you know, there's, there's an adage in about the IDF that, you know, Israel will always defend itself by itself. Well, I think it's also, Israel needs to decide these types of issues for itself, by itself, you know, develop, you know, not not in the middle of the night, you know, not like, you know, like thieves in the night, but developing a national consensus. Yeah. And I think that, you know, my, my view is, you know, regardless of whatever bumps in the road there may be, Israel is a strong enough country right now to withstand that type of uh, introspection. And I think the world will respect Israel when Israel respects itself. And I think, you know, God has given Israel the greatest argument, you know, yeah. the best argument ever for, for places, you know, for, for its biblical homeland. And by the way, I should just point out one, I'll give myself one plug. Mike Pompeo and I have a documentary coming out in uh, early 2023 called Route 60, The Biblical Highway. Hmm. And uh, he and I, you know, went from Nazareth to Beersheba, stopping all along the way and talking about, you know, this one road, which within the kilometers of it in any direction, you really have the whole story of the Bible, both the uh, Old and the New Testament. And so yeah. we... Uh, uh, look, I, I, I think it's time for Israel to take a, you know, to take a serious stab at trying to get this right. Uh, not, not in a rush, not, you know, not with you know, yelling or screaming, but, mm -hmm. you know, respecting its people and really making, making a decision. Well, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying because you basically are reiterating the mission statement of Imtir Tzu, which <laughs> is that uh, we are a just, humane place and we we will be even more just and more humane when we assert our own sovereignty and our own control over our destiny. And yes. Because we're coming from a good place and we, we only want to do good with it. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, you know, listening to you, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, uh, wistful that you're not, <laughs> you know, closer to the action because we could... We certainly um, could use you in in a, in a command position, in, in a very important position, because you profoundly get it, at least uh, I think as the great majority of Israelis see it. And we greatly appreciate the contribution that you made, that President Trump made, that Secretary Pompeo made, the whole team made. 
uh, and uh, we hope to build from strength to strength, as they say. So I want to thank you for your time today, David. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving, and uh, I hope we have an opportunity to uh, reprise this uh, sometime in the future. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Great to talk to you. Thank you.